presenting for for years and years, and people say, uh, "Do you get nervous?" No, not really. We're all friends here. Um, what I get nervous is, is those introductions. They are the most embarrassing. Thank you very much. I was they embarrassed were, too. They were the <laughs> most, they're the most embarrassing things. Uh, I'm just John Roman. How's that? Um, forget about the, uh, that other stuff. And I've been doing this for about 35 years. Uh, but a couple housekeeping things. Anybody who wants a copy of the presentation before you leave, just give me your business card, and I'll shoot it out to you. Uh, I was also instructed to tell everybody to move closer, but I think if you do, we're going to really get jammed up here. So it's a, it's a, a nice crowd. Um, again, I want to uh, thank Avani and uh, Maurer for sponsoring this event, uh, and thank you, uh, Chamber, for inviting me to do this. This is uh, fantastic. So. Uh, Hopefully this will be interactive. Uh, I move around a lot. Uh, sometimes people have to tell me to shut up, so don't be shy, especially my friends that are in the room. They're absolutely not shy. Uh, but uh, let me give you a little, I'll give you a little, uh, that was great uh, background, but I've been in IT for about 35 years, which is remarkable since I'm only 42 years old. But, um, and I've had a lot of different positions. I was a customer service engineer, uh, I was a consultant, I traveled the, the country, and I did network planning, I, I did, uh, anybody familiar with Spencer Gifts? S Spencer Gifts is my claim to fame. I did their uh, strategic plan, I did all of their data networking, I did all of their computing, I did all of their POS stuff in their stores, um, uh, and you have to see their quality assurance shot. It's amazing, I mean, I walk, this is no lie, I walk in there, they're having, uh, they were uh, selling, at the time they were new, the super soakers. And they're having a super soaker battle in the, in the back of this room, the employees. It was awesome. So anyway, uh, I'm at, uh, now I'm at um, Fox Point and Bonadio. So Bonadio, I'm the CIO uh, with Fox Point Solutions. I am their president and uh, chief operating officer. I'll get into a little more of that in a, in a second. But let's talk a little, let's set the stage, okay? So it's no surprise that uh, the internet is growing in terms of its use. What a great invention by Al Gore. Uh, <laughs> and uh, currently, there are about almost five billion connected devices. Uh, what compounds the issue of information security today is there are 5.11 billion mobile devices in the world. Does anybody know what the world population is as of January, uh, December 31st? 7.1 billion. So what that means is almost every man, woman, and child has a cell phone. More people have cell phones before they have running water and electricity, by the way. Uh, and this is a huge opportunity if you're a hacker. It's a huge opportunity for a nation state um, and just as we have evolved in our careers, hackers have evolved. Uh, if you all remember, uh, anybody received the Nigerian Prince email, right? Uh, has anybody, and I'm not joking, has anybody received the Nigerian astronaut email? Okay, well, it's true. There's a Nigerian astronaut who's stuck on the moon. And all you gotta do is pay him $15,000. We'll get his butt right back there. Uh, so they've evolved a little bit more to look a lot more legit than in the past. Um, most people, uh, most company, I, I consult with a lot of small to medium sized businesses, let's say um, 25 to 1,000 employees. And when I meet with CEOs, um, or C-level people, uh, they're always, you know, who would target us? We're a small company. We're such and such company. Nobody's gonna come. Uh, the problem is 60% uh, of all targeted attacks affect small to medium-sized business. Why do you think, by the way? It, bingo, right? They're not prepared, right? They don't have, the, whatever, whatever the reason, they have the time, they have the money, they have the resource, they're not prepared, right? So oftentimes people think that 
JP Morgan Chase is going to be a huge target, incidentally, which it is. But I met with their uh, chief information security officer uh, in Manhattan in July. And guess how many people they have in information security? About 15,000. 15,000 people that work in information security. So they're a little harder to, you know, they're a little harder to attack than, you know, John Roman Enterprises with 100 employees. Uh, and then finally, who's upset with the United States? Russia, North Korea, now it's Iran, Ukraine, China, whatever other country that's going to be upset with us, or quite honestly, uh, could be an organization within the United States or an employee who's upset with us, they're just as prolific than any, anybody else. So, okay, did I get everybody's attention? I give you a bunch of good news. It's doom and gloom, forget about it, we're all in trouble. So, uh, today we're gonna talk about why should we protect data. Uh, I'm gonna get into a little bit about risk assessments. Um, uh, I, I teach risk assessments. I'm, a, I'm an adjunct professor at the Ruster Institute of Technology. I teach a computer security course there. And what we're gonna cover in about five minutes, I take two full classes to cover. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, a risk assessment primer. We'll get into the Shield Act. Um, hopefully I'll save you reading that 10 page document and I tried to boil it down to five slides that I think cover most of it. Uh, I'll put you through, uh, I'll take you through a little training and then we'll wrap it up and we should be done in an hour, maybe a little bit less, okay? And of course, please interrupt me, ask me questions. This only works, especially when, in, when we get into the Shield app, uh, this will be a little dry for about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, real quick commercial or else you know the friends at the home office will criticize me. Uh, so who's this Fox Point Solutions? So Fox Point Solutions is just a rebrand of Bonadio's Enterprise Risk Management. The Enterprise Risk Management practice was founded by two partners about 10 years ago. Um, they were growing at a pretty good clip, and lo and behold, over the past six years, we've been growing double-digit revenue-wide. Um, we also were finding it difficult to partner with other accounting firms, other technology companies, because who wants to partner with an accounting firm, right? Especially if you're another accounting firm. Uh, so we rebranded ourselves, uh, Maurer uh, was instrumental in that. Thank you very much, by the way, uh, Brad. Um, and um, we launched in October of 2019 as Fox Point Solutions. And we really focus on three things. Compliance, so compliance related to HIPAA, high trust, SOC 2, uh, PCI. In fact, we're one of the only PCI and high trust people in upstate New York. Um, and uh, Shield, New York State DFS, GLBA, etc. Uh, we also have a penetration testing and ethical hacking practice where on the ethical hacking side, we act as a hacker. We typically get hired by a CIO or chief information security officer and basically they say, uh, we're gonna give you guys two weeks and I wanna see if my IT department can catch you. So we do various things. We'll, we'll, it starts with social engineering. We do our research. Um, we've walked in behind people with key cards. They just, people are nice, right? 95% of the world, really nice. It's the 5% that we hear about. We walk in behind, we go into an empty conference room, we get on their wireless network, we run a little hacking tool, get on the wireless network, and we take over the network. Uh, we run other tools outside of the network, and we're hoping that we're, IT is catching us along the way, and if they're not, we'll let the CIO know, whoever our sponsor know, is, hey listen, we got to your uh, Windows 2012 servers, do you want us to continue going further? And sometimes we get a yes, and sometimes people say no, that's okay, you're good. Um, <clears throat> and then IT audits, IT audits really specific to financial institutions, uh, uh, credit unions and banks, uh, 250 million in assets up to our largest bank is almost 10 billion in assets, <clears throat> excuse me, that we provide IT audits for. And then uh, our third focus area, which is really more general consulting, so 
uh, virtual chief information security officer services, writing of information security plans uh, that we'll talk about in SHIELD, policy and procedure development, uh, et cetera. Okay, so now we're gonna go over every single one of these definitions. <laughs> Uh, and then the next slide is I'm going to quiz everybody on every single one of these definitions. Uh, so this is just a quick reference. Okay, so why protect data, and what's the need? What's the need for security regulation? So <clears throat> the need for state security regulations is because the United States government can't get their act together. That's number one. Uh, even though I think over the next two years we will have a, anybody familiar with GDPR in the uh, EU, right? So we'll have our own data privacy federal regulation. But until such time, every single state is coming out with their own. Um, and quite honestly, New York is a little behind. Massachusetts was probably one of the first behind Nevada. Uh, and, I, and I did a lot of Massachusetts security regulation work for Lyon. But uh, another reason why uh, the SHIELD Act was enabled and why we have to protect data is because <coughs> we don't want to be in the news, right? Uh, and um, a healthcare organization in Louisiana, uh, they just filed a class action lawsuit against this healthcare provider who received a ransomware attack and they were down for a week and they weren't able to take patients in, so they're being sued by, I think, the state or something. So, uh, and, you know, how many people haven't heard of a breach over the past 90 days? It's just, we're, we're becoming breach numb now, right? I mean, think about it. Uh, how many people's credit cards have been breached? Right? And how many people care? How many people have suffered a financial loss because of that breach? One person, okay? So, and, and that, uh, that goes along with trends. We don't care, typically people now don't care if their credit card numbers get breached, why? Because the credit card memory makes us whole, right? I got a call, uh, Capital One, I have a Capital One card. And uh, I get a call, or no, I have an alert on my card, and basically, uh, there were four charges in a matter of an hour, two, one from the Bronx, one from someplace in New Jersey, and two from Ruston, Virginia. Uh, they must have been on an Apple phone buying spree because two out of the three bought Apple phones at $750 each. So anyway, I call Capital One up and I go, listen, before you take me through your phone screen, it, don't ask me if I purchased this stuff because it would be impossible for a human being to be in the Bronx and then an hour later in Ruston, Virginia. So of course they asked me did I purchase these things. <laughs> but after 2,000 in charges, I was made whole, right? I, I get made whole, I get a new credit card, life goes on. And I think we're becoming too numb to the fact that hey, I'm gonna be made whole, so why should I bother? Who cares, right? Um, a little more information, um, hackers are getting, uh, a lot better at bypassing some of the security controls that we're putting in place. Uh, in this example, um, uh, anybody a member of InfraGuard, the F FBI InfraGuard program? Okay, so you and I are both members. Uh, so this came from InfraGuard where cyber criminals are bypassing multi-factor authentication, which is you have a password and then something else to get in, right? Uh, but they do this through social engineering. They don't do it through a technology trip because you can't bypass uh, multi-factor authentication using some tool to, uh, uh, to bypass it. Um, and in October, uh, there were 371 breaches, and out of the 371 breaches, 39 million people were affected. So that's not too bad if you're a hacker, right? I mean, think about it. If you're a hacker, it's pretty lucrative business. Um, there are how many internet connected devices? You're paying attention, good. Uh, so 5.1, I'm a hacker, I uh, scan the internet for vulnerabilities. What percentage do I need to be successful? Less than a percent, right? If I get less than a percent on 5.11 billion, it's pretty good. 
I'll take that. Uh, and so it, it's just the, it, it's the reality that we live in. And now with internet, uh, internet of thing devices where we're connecting our refrigerators and popcorn machines and milkshake makers to the internet, it's only gonna get worse. Because I guarantee you, Frigidaire doesn't have security in mind when they build your IoT refrigerator. Okay, and then finally, um, you know, uh, I attend presentations like this, and nobody ever talks about, well, why don't you help me protect my data? You're telling me how to protect my company's data, but how about helping me protect my data, right? And we're all affected by a breach. Everybody in this room has been affected by it, has had your information breached. Did you agree? Who said no? All right. So if you applied for credit in Equifax, ran your credit check, which they do, then you were breached. Everybody was breached, right? Um, but again, people are being numb to that, right? Okay, well, my social security number's out there. You know, so what? Well, until somebody is an identity thief and you have to spend three years getting your identity back because somebody used their social security number, like somebody used mine to file a tax return three years ago. And that was a real joy. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little story about that. So uh, this was before I worked for Bonadio, so I can't mention TurboTax when I'm at work, because that's kind of a no-no, right? Uh, <clears throat> so prior to working for Bonadio, uh, I was using TurboTax. So I go to submit my taxes, and I get an error back. Uh, so like any good IT person, what do you do? You resubmit. And like any really, really good IT person, what do you do? You resubmit, then you swear. And you blame TurboTax for not uh, doing the right thing. So I'm like, what in the world is going on? So uh, I pick up the phone, I call TurboTax, and I say, I can't submit my taxes. And uh, uh, the lady was actually very helpful, and she goes, uh, hold on just a second. And the next thing I know, somebody answers the phone, TurboTax fraud protection, how can I help you, right? So I go, I wasn't able to, to uh, submit my taxes. She goes, well, go here, 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 what's the error? She goes, somebody, is, somebody already submitted their taxes with your social security number. I go, oh, that's terrific, what do I have to do? Call the police immediately. I go, what are they gonna do? I go, please. <laughs> she goes, well, what you really should do is call the social security office, call the IRS, call the So I call the social security office, and do you know what they tell me? That's a shame. <laughs> you're, once you're given a social security number, you have that number until you die. 42 other people can have your number, but you have that number until you die. So she's like, we can't help you. I go, really? We can't help you. Call the FTC. I call the FTC. Trying to get into the FTC is, you know, try to get into the White House without an appointment. So. Honestly, the IRS helped me. I talked to somebody after being on hold an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, I talked to somebody at the IRS. The woman says to me, I see the tax return. And uh, I go, well, who is it? Well, we can't tell you that. I go, you can't tell me a cr who the criminal is that you think? So long story short, she said, here's what you have to do. Every year now, I get a special pen. And it gets appended to my social security number, and that's the only way I can submit my taxes. So it affects all of us. I mean. Disney Plus, literally five days after they launched, they were breached. Wow. Okay, any questions? I know I'm talking fast. All right, so the basis of- Okay, John, I yeah. can't stand it, I can't wait. How do I get one of those pins for on my taxes? Is that something you can request? Do you know that? You, I, I don't know. I would suspect that you can request it. I would suspect that, um, you know. Florida, Georgia, Washington, D.C. and people like to request taxes. That's it? You can't pick up the phone and request it? But they changed the rule this year. But if you give me your card and note it, I'll ask somebody at work. They'll know. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not a CPA, but I play one occasionally. Um, <laughs> That's, that's why I used to tell people when I work for Nixon Peabody, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one at TV. So risk assessments are the basis of every single, and we're gonna talk about risk, risk assessments as they relate to information security and IT, not as they relate to business uh, risk assessments. 
uh, is really the basis for every single information security program. And quite honestly, every single information security related regulation, whether it's HIPAA, GLBA, New York State DFS, New York Shield, etc., etc., etc. They all say you must perform a risk assessment and then perform one minimally annually. And so then everybody's like, what the heck is a risk assessment? And oh my gosh, it's going to take me forever to, to perform a risk assessment. But uh, forget about that stuff for a second. I always get it. So now I put my CIO hat on and I always get calls from. Uh, salespeople and when um, when I take meetings I always get asked the same question what keeps you up at night and I always give everybody the same answer nothing my head hits that pillow literally 37 and a half seconds later I am asleep uh, except for that except for ransomware um, Two weeks ago, a marketing company with 300 employees is probably going to declare bankruptcy because they were hit so hard. Uh, they've been down for two weeks. They can't recover. Um, and it's going to get worse. It's get North Korea in 2019. How much money do you think North Korea made in ransomware? Take a guess, anybody. $215 million in ransomware. We're sanctioning the heck out of them, right? It, it, money's gotta come from someplace. I mean, you know, money's not, they're developing nuclear weapons. They gotta have money to do this stuff. So this is what they're doing. Iran, we are gonna see a tsunami of ransomware attacks that get generated from Iran. It's the most destructive, productivity wasting, money losing malware that's in my opinion that's ever been invented ever been invented all right so this is another reason why you want to perform a risk assessment forget about everything else this is it okay so uh, risk assessments are all about probability of loss right uh, and probability statistics wise uh, you can either be a, a 0 to 100, a 0 to 10. It can't be a negative, it can't go over 100. Uh, it's based upon uh, impact, uh, it's based upon your tolerance to that risk, the probability of the risk, but you have to start, right? And you have to identify um, uh, what it is that you have in your pos possession. And in New York Shields case, it's uh, non-public or private information and you can really only do three things with risk right you can accept it hey I'm gonna accept this risk because the likelihood uh, this happening is pretty close to zero uh, I'm gonna transfer the risk uh, we have a cyber insurance policy so if we get a breach um, I'll transfer that risk to the cyber insurance policy because we're covered up to ten million dollars uh, or we're gonna uh, reduce it uh, we're going to reduce uh, the risk of ransomware infecting our network by implementing <coughs> employee security awareness training and some type of technology. Hey, John. Yeah. On the insurance front, you know, are the insurance companies doing everything they can to avoid paying out claims or yeah, what's the criteria that <laughs> qualifies for a payout? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So. Um, Back when I worked for Nixon, we represented a humongous insurance company in Manhattan. And this was in 2008. They were one of the first companies that were developing this new cyber insurance policy. And I sat in a meeting for two hours and they were discussing ways how they don't have to pay out. What can we put in the contract that says, well, if the breach occurred because you didn't update your antivirus software, we don't have to pay it. Since then, uh, it's become a little less stringent. Um, if, if the breach occurred because the insurance company found that the company was negligent, i.e. 
you didn't update your antivirus software for over a year, then they're not going to pay you. If you were doing everything to maintain your security posture through the normal day-to-day -day operation of the company and a breach occurred because there was some vulnerability that you didn't know about, I, 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 they're going to pay. They're going to pay. Um, now, I haven't been involved in if a breach occurred and you weren't and you were you were regulated by Shield and you didn't have an information security program in place that met the Shield regulation, are you going to get paid? I suspect the answer would be no, but I don't know for a fact. Because they're going to say, "Wait a minute. There's this new regulation, it's called Shield, or if you're a financial institution, you're regulated under New York State Department of Financial Services. They told you to create an information security plan. They told you to perform a risk assessment. You don't have either, and you were breached. Well, then you're negligent. So I suspect that's coming, but I don't know 100%. But great question. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there are tons of risk assessment <coughs> methodologies depending upon what you're doing. But this is basically kind of the five steps to, to perform a risk assessment. And it's uh, uh, you, you uh, figure out what it is that you need to protect, number one. So let's say we need to protect this device. And then you, it's really a brainstorming exercise. What are all the risks uh, involved in protecting this computer, right? Well, uh, risk is John Roman leaves the building, leaves it in his car unlocked, somebody steals it. Well, that's a risk. And what's the probability of that risk happening, right? And what's the likelihood of that risk happening? And then based upon the likelihood and probability, you get that, right? Uh, if it's uh, highly, uh, the likelihood is highly unlikely and the impact to that data is minor, well then uh, your residual risk is low. And most people don't even deal with medium and low residual risks. Uh, most people start with highs. Uh, if something is uh, a high risk um, uh, or severe, then people treat those risks in one of the three fashions, right? You accept it, you reduce it, or you transfer it. Um, I love uh, this. This says it all, by the way. Forget about that. And if you were to print this out and cut that out, and just, that, that defines risk. Right? Uh, the bottom one is pretty risky. So and it's a high probability that if you try to jump, you're going to land uh, where you don't want to land. Any questions on risk assessments? Again, they're the foundation of every, if you're not performing a risk assessment uh, and you're not updating it and performing it routinely, then don't even start on any type of compliance documentation. Okay, so now what you've all been here for the SHIELD Act, or the Stop Hacks and Improved Electronic Data Security Act. Um, so basically, SHIELD is an amendment to this general business law that the state has had in place forever and ever and ever. Uh, and in this general business law, there have been, there, there is um, guidance and regulation about securing information and what our responsibilities are as New York State companies to secure information. Uh, but what SHIELD does, um, which is basically the same thing that Massachusetts, California, Nevada, and probably every other state uh, has, is now SHIELD applies to any business in New York State or outside of New York State who contain New York State resident personal and private information. Yes, that means your employees, too. Um, there's expanded breach requirements uh, because uh, you know companies have known about breaches for months and months and they don't report them until it's too late. Um, some exemptions, so if you're a small business with less than uh, 50 employees and $3 million in revenue, you're exempt from many of the requirements of SHIELD. 
The problem is I haven't found any place in the legislation of what that means, which does any, that shouldn't be a surprise, right? Uh, other companies who are larger than that but are already compliant with HIPAA, New York State DFS, uh, security regulation, GLBA, uh, are compliant with SHIELD. So if you already have that in place, then you're automatically compliant. Okay? All right. So what are the changes? So first of all, one change is private information is, is defined as, so the first bullet, social security number, driver's license, that's considered non-public information. The easiest way to remember non-public information is if you can Google it and find it, it's now public. And if you Google it and you can't find it, it's non-public. Um, what they've added to define private information are the last three bullets. So biometrics, so uh, anybody uh, use their face to log into their iPhone, Android, Windows Hello, right? Anybody use their fingerprint? Uh, I don't know if anybody uses their retina, but uh, anybody use their retina? Well, that data is stored some ways, by the way. So that's considered private. Uh, your username and email address with an associated password is now considered private. And then finally, any unsecured personal health information or protected health information, you are now considered a covered entity and that's what's considered private. So this is one of the major changes is the difference between personal and private, and the difference is the last three bullets. Biometric, username, uh, that, uh, or email address in a combination with a password, and then unsecured protected health information. Anybody know when this goes into effect? March 21st. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, bullet number one, uh, excuse me, bullet number two of the SHIELD Act is uh, create an information security or data security program. So uh, just like any other program, a program is this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, this is how often we're going to do it. And uh, a data security program consists of uh, an information security plan that's documented, associated policies and procedures, uh, your annual risk assessment, and um, these three things that the SHIELD Act specifies as administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. So uh, policies. These are the John Roman top policies. If I were going to write any policies, these are the policies I would write, and I would stop there. Are these complete? No, they're not. But I think if you were audited via SHIELD and you had these policies, you'd be good. All right. um, the key is that a lot of times companies develop these policies, they send them out to every single employee and why would an employee care about access control? Who cares? Okay. Listen, IT, I'm assuming you're doing your job and giving me access that I need and preventing me from viewing everything. So I don't, I'm not gonna read an access control policy, but I am gonna read a responsible use of IT resources policy, right? And I am gonna read the email policy. So uh, my guidance is always you're gonna have really two sets of policies. Those policies that you're gonna require your employees to read, which should be about that many because we all know we love to read policies. And then those policies that IT employees are gonna be bound by because they're supporting this environment and they're protecting uh, the information, uh, the private information uh, within our organizations. Okay, so administrative safeguards. What in the heck is administrative safeguards? Uh, it's really, um, defined as policies and procedures um, and people uh, to prevent and or 
uh, restrict access to private information, right? And so uh, bullet number one is the first requirement of the SHIELD Act. Every company to comply has to assign a person who's gonna be responsible for the security program. They don't tell you who this person has to be. Massachusetts says a CIO, a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. New York does not. New York just says you need to assign a person. Those companies who I work with uh, typically have a Chief Information Security Officer, a Director of Information Security, uh, their Director of IT is also their Data Security Program Manager. For the smaller companies that um, can't afford to hire $150,000, $200,000 a year Chief Information Security Officer, uh, you can hire somebody to do it part-time, this new term called the Virtual CISO, right? And he or she comes in for 10 hours a month and they will create your information security program. They'll represent you um, during an audit from an IT perspective, et cetera. Um, other uh, safeguards, you know, second bullet is risk assessment, right? Uh, the third is, uh, excuse me, the second and third are risk assessment. The fourth is an employee security uh, awareness program. Anybody in your company go through employee security awareness? Do your companies have an employee security awareness program? Okay. Um, applies to anybody who does business with a third party. So if you have an IT service provider, if you have an HVAC provider, they have to sign, it's called the third party, I think it's called the third party provider agreement, which is, it's similar to a agreement if you're familiar with HIPAA. So your vendors have to, you have to ensure that your vendors are complying to your information security policies because uh, about ransomware being destructive, most major breaches occur of a company through their service provider, by the way. So they have a connection, but the breach occurs through the service provider and then the hacker gets in that way to the company they're trying to attack. Um, and then of course, like any other policy or procedure or program that you have, you have to keep it updated, right? Uh, minimally on an annual basis. Uh, ideally, anytime there's a change to the business or to the IT environment and to, or the data that you're protecting, you should probably upgrade the policy. Okay, uh, people. Um, you can implement all kinds of technology and you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of technology. Unfortunately, uh, you can't uh, implement a technology that prevents an employee from clicking on a malicious link found in an email message. Impossible, right? Uh, so uh, that three-legged stool of a great information security program, which is policy, procedure, people, and technology, people, us, are the firewall. Right, We're, employees and us sitting around this room are really the first line of defense. Right, we we have. Uh, oh, let me tell you a little story. So I worked at Nixon. My, my one of my best friends there um, uh, wasn't an IT person, and um, we had a policy. They still do that. If you get a virus on your PC, we take the PC away. We wipe it clean, we reload it, and we give it back to you, and that takes about four hours. So there's a kind of a hygienic approach, right? Um, because just because a virus is quarantined and antivirus says it's removed, it's not removed. There's still remnants of that virus on your PC. And the only way to ensure that it's removed entirely is you gotta wipe the PC clean thoroughly. Okay, so we get this notification, and uh, I go down there, I go, you got a virus, you gotta take your PC. Okay, fine. Literally, a week and a half later, we get a notification. Lou's PC has a virus on it. Okay, go down. We go down there, we get a PC. Six weeks after that, we get another notification. So I go, all right. So I pick up the phone, I go, buddy, are you lonely? <laughs> what do you mean? I, well, I, do you not get enough emails during the day? I mean, do you feel, what, what's going on with you? He goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I go, you have another virus. You clicked another link. What is your problem? Do you, not, do you not get an, I mean, 
Did you even know who it came from? Well, I don't know. You know, you never know. I go, well, you know, you get with the program. So anyway, uh, you you uh, you have to use your people to be the firewall. And these are kind of my. I try to make uh, employee security awareness training relatable to the people, the person, rather than relatable to the company. Because we all have a stake in the game, and if you don't make it relatable to that person, like how do you protect your own information uh, in addition to protecting the company, people kind of zone out sometimes. Uh, and there's all different ways, you know, Know Before is a company that provides interactive employee security awareness training. Um, more and more companies are using these phishing tests. Everybody know what phishing is? Um, uh, so phishing tests and to test people uh, to make sure that they're looking at URLs correctly, um, et cetera. But I'm a, every company um, should have a big sign when employees walk in that says, you are the firewall. But not always practical. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, technical safeguards. This is all about implementation of technology. Uh, in technology that really provides uh, what the, uh, the industry says is security in depth. Uh, there are controls to restrict, prevent, uh, protect personal and private information. Um, uh, what's important is information also needs to pr be protected when it's not connected to the network. So uh, again, if uh, these are my top if you were to implement these few bullets, you'd be pretty good. Um, would you be perfect? No, but nobody is. Uh, but if you had anti-malware and screensavers with passwords and account lockouts and firewalls, firewalls not only on the network, but on the PC itself, and intrusion prevention not only on the network, but on the PC itself, full disk encryption and some type of mobile device management, you'd be good. You'd be reducing your risk pretty well. Um, so that's what technical safeguards are all about. Questions? Okay. And then finally, physical safeguards. So, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about electronic, 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 but what about hard copy? So, what are we doing to protect? protect hard copy information that contains that private or non-public information. What are we doing to protect the spreadsheet that's three pages long that's sitting on somebody's desk that has every employee's social security number on it? Um, and that you have a cleaning crew that comes in that could have access to it. Uh, so we never think about that, but Shield is also, uh, also identifies with hard copy information. And uh, the proper ways of disposing of physical stuff. Uh, I don't know if anybody still uses CDs or DVDs anymore, uh, but disposing of those and disposing of uh, hard disk drives or solid state drives uh, before uh, you throw that computer away or before you recycle that computer. Uh, do you have destruction bins and do you use shredders, et cetera? Uh, how do you protect the physical asset, right? Is your data, is your um, in, uh, computer room uh, secured via a lock, key card access, maybe both? Um, um, a lot of uh, data centers, larger ones, um, uh, do have both uh, biometric and retina scans to, you know, uh, to protect entry into the into, uh, their data. So that's what physical safeguards is all about. The, and these are all, and so everybody's probably thinking, oh my God, you know, what in the world, how, how, how much money do I have to spend to be compliant? I'm like, the good news is the state isn't telling you, you must, you must, you must implement full disk encryption. You must implement video cameras. You must have, but they're saying, these are all the things that make up your compliance and shield. And if it doesn't make sense to have video cameras in your office, but 
you don't have any type of vetting of somebody coming in from the outside, like a sign-in sheet and a sign-out sheet, then you're probably going to be in trouble. Okay. <clears throat> Finally, we talked about these expanded, expanded breach notification requirements. This is really driven uh, by companies, uh, typically larger ones, that have known for months and months and months that they've been breached and haven't notified anyone. And then you know, finally the state is cracking down, saying we're going to do something about it. So the first change is it's not about acquisition. It's also about access. So if you get breached and none of your data was exfiltrated or copied out by the hacker, it's still considered a breach because chances are the hacker looked at that data, right? If you really want to get extreme, which is also in the law, if I have access to your financial records inadvertently, as an employee, we're both employees, and inadvertently I'm given access and I review it, you've suffered a breach. So it applies both for internal employees, external, you know, the bad news we always hear about, but nobody thinks about, well, what happens if so-and-so views you know, financial records they're not supposed to? Technically, it's a breach, it's an incident. Okay? Same thing with hard copy. Uh, you, go to work, you go home, you leave a stack of your financial statements on your desk, you come in the morning, it's gone. Nobody knows where it is, it's a breach. Okay. Um, if it's an incident that involves private information of 500 people or more, 500 New York State residents or more, then uh, you're required to submit documentation to the state's attorney general within 10 days of that determination. So a lot of time, what's, does anybody know what the average time is to detect a breach? 90 days. Yeah, it's about 90 days, right? So that doesn't mean you get penalized those 90 days of that $20 per day for failure to notify. That means that, okay, after 90 days, you find out somebody's been rooting around. Uh, you have 10 days that, to report to the state attorney general. For every day after that that you don't, you get fined up to $20 uh, per failed notification or $250. And that was effective, everybody, October 23rd, 2019. So you all better get back right now and start working on this stuff, okay? So what we just covered is the SHIELD Act. Any questions before I wrap it up? Rich? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, the only way to recover, uh, I don't want to say the only way because things change every second. Um, the only way that I know of, and I don't know everything, as my children tell me all the time, um, is to recover from a ransomware attack without paying the ransom and even if you do pay the ransom, there is no guarantee that they're gonna give you an encryption key that works, because we all know hackers are very ethical people, and they are gonna, <laughs> you know, um, is you have to have a backup. And the backup should probably be pretty recent, if not within the last 24 hours, at least within the last week. The problem is that a lot of companies now have disk-to-disk -disk backup, Anything attached to the network that has a disk and a file share designation, an H drive, an F drive, a G drive, that ransomware infects. So if you haven't segregated, so if you haven't unplugged that device from the network so it doesn't get infected, or taken uh, control, uh, electronic control 
that says this device can only be written to by this user, this application, it's going to get infected. That's the only way to recover from a ransomware attack. How'd I do, Rich? All right, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Okay, so let's do something kind of fun. Uh, so you all said you know what phishing is. So you're all experts in the room in phishing. Excellent. Well, we're going to see. Okay, so um, before we can detect or ask our employees to detect a suspicious link in an email message, you got to know how to read a URL, right? If you don't know how to read a URL, I mean, you have to start somewhere. So this is a legitimate URL, right? Everybody knows this company, especially over the past 30 days. Now your credit cards are coming due. Um, uh, the country codes are uh, country code domains. Uh, a lot of com countries don't use .com, .gov, .mil. They use their country code designation. Canada is one of the major ones, right? Everything's .ca. Um, and then there's the commercial ones that were, or excuse me, the generic domains that we're all familiar with uh, that I just mentioned. But when you look at a URL, uh, the first thing that you should look at is uh, HTTPS. S stands for what? Secure. Secure, right? A lot of people think S stands for safe, by the way. Not everybody is as savvy as you folks are, but everybody is safe. No, it's not safe. 99% of the websites now have HTTPS, which means it's secure. Doesn't mean it's legit, it's legit, but it means that transmission, that data in motion is now being secure. Okay, the second thing to look at uh, is the domain. Is it legit? Right? And this one appears to be legit. The next thing is the subdomain or the host. Okay? So, so far so good? All right. So, we all have this, right? Okay. So, what is wrong with this URL? Anything? Okay. Hit me with it. What? No S, okay. Domain is different. The domain is, the domain is different. What is it? It's Russia, right? So we'd all click on that. Well, my friend Lou would click on it. That I know for a fact. Uh, because he'd say, I'm waiting some, for something from Amazon, and it could come from Russia. You never know. All right? Okay. How about this one? Okay, the host is what? Czech Republic, right? CZ. Good. Okay. How about this one? Exactly. Right? Who, that, who knows where 65.26 is taking you? Right? So you wouldn't click on that one because you don't know. All right, how about that one? This one's tricky. What do you think? Well, Would you click on it? It's not secure. Not secure. No. All right, it's not secure, but... And I don't know where it came from. Okay. So tiny URLs are tricky, right? Because there's a lot of tiny URLs, which basically, uh, a tiny URL, there's a, a site that you can go to that takes a web address that, that, that's that's long and calls it a tiny URL with a number at. So there are legitimate sites that are tiny URLized. You see it if you have a Twitter account, there's a ton of URLs that are tiny URLs in Twitter. But if I got this in an email message, I would never click on that because somebody mentioned it. Who the heck knows where it's going? All right. Okay. How about those? <laughs> well, what's wrong with the first one? about the second one. Do you know, during phishing tests, how many people click on these two? But think about it. Does anybody get less than 10 emails a day? Does anybody get less than 50 emails a day? Right. So holiday time just passed. We are so busy during the day and you know you're supposed to be getting something from Amazon. 
and we're all doing 25 different things at once, and you get this email from Amazon, this easily can get by. Especially if the email is formatted correctly, right? This can easily get by because hackers also take advantage of how busy people are, that you're not paying attention. So don't be aloof, right? Don't click on that link, really look at it. But that's, that's the reality. Uh, and that's what those two uh, in phishing tests, those two get everybody, especially around this time of year, because people aren't paying attention. The first one in particular. John? John? Yeah? How, how does your phone, your phone device translate into enterprise risk in a, in a context like this? Yeah, that's a uh, great question. So uh, if you own an iPhone, uh, and I'm, I own an iPhone, I got a new Apple Watch, by the way, for Christmas. Um, now I'm one of the cool kids. Uh, Apple does a really good job at compartmentalizing applications within the application. So it is extremely rare for an iPhone to get a virus and that virus to go from email to the, from the email app to the pick whatever app you have on your phone. Almost impossible because the way the operating system and the hardware is configured is each one of those apps runs in its own secure environment. Android is totally different. Android, it, Android security has gotten eons better, but it's still the most vulnerable mobile operating system ever created because of its openness, right? Anybody can develop uh, a Google app. So um, very rarely, if you clicked on a malicious link on your phone, would it traverse into your corporate network? You'd have to be connected to, you'd have to click that link on your PC in order for it to infect your network. But it has happened. But most of the mobile attacks affect the phone and exfiltrate the data that's on the phone out. Uh, okay, so how many people have been breached? One? I mean, ser seriously, how many people in the room have had their email accounts breached? Okay, a couple of you? All right, well, let's find out. Anybody been to this site? Okay, have I been pawn.com? So, uh, if you think you haven't been, your email address haven't, hasn't been breached, I would strongly recommend you go to the site and you get back to your office. And I think you might be a little shocked to find out that it may have. Like mine has, jroman at bonadio.com. Uh, anybody that's had a LinkedIn, has a LinkedIn account, yours has been breached, because LinkedIn has suffered a breach, right? Uh, but, if you put this in, it's gonna tell you the site that's been breached. And then, uh, what's your follow-up question? Everyone's gonna have a follow-up question. What do you do? What do you do, right? Uh, you get a brand new email address and move to California or something. No, you uh, typically, whenever, what, what I did is any account that I used that as my login ID, I changed the passwords because chances are, you know, I'm a security guy, but I'm a security violator too. We all use the same password for more than one site, right? Uh, so just to be safe, I changed all my passwords. Okay? Uh, all right, so how many people have received uh, doom and gloom? Oh my God, Iran is gonna launch massive cyber attacks against US companies. And here are the top 10 ways to prevent or reduce the risk of attack. How many, how many have received those? Or how many have received those, forget about Iran, could be for anything, right? All right, so I'm gonna give you back 10 minutes of your lives. Don't read them anymore. <laughs> Don't read them. Because they all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. And security professionals have been telling everybody these 10 things, 11 things, for the last seven years. So there is no magic bullet. There, nothing in that article is gonna be a eureka, holy crap, I gotta go buy this thing because that's gonna prevent, right? I, I can't tell you how many times people ask me, how do I prevent a breach? Well, don't give an employee a computer and don't have an internet connection. <laughs> I can assure you, you will not be breached, right? So, 
If you're not patching your servers and your computers with the latest Windows security patches every 30 days, you are, you're, everybody in this room is going to get breached. Your company is going to get breached. No doubt about it. All right? That's number one. Number two. You must have anti-malware, firewalls, and intrusion prevention systems at all of your endpoints. You have to encrypt data in motion. So not only data in motion electronically, right, using encryption for email, but also data in motion as it relates to these and your iPhones, they should be full disk encrypted. How many iPhones, how many iPhones were lost in Chicago two years ago in a taxi cab? How many do you think? iPhones, thousand. Thousand, anybody else? About 56,000. That's Chicago iPhones only. And Manhattan must be 56 million, right? So uh, that's why we encrypt data in motion. Passwords, everybody hates passwords. I got it, I know, I hate them too. Uh, I use a passphrase now because my dog is spotted is a lot easier for me to remember than 893, symbol for boron, 796352. And you can use a password keeper too. Anti-spam email filter, right? Uh, you can greatly reduce the risk of those malicious URLs coming in if you had some type of email gateway that filters those out, probably by 75%. Uh, Multi-factor authentication. Uh, how many of your banks now use multi-factor authentication? Uh, do you use them once to log in or every time you log in? Every time, ESL just changed. Every time you log in the ESL, they hit you with a text, right? The only way, one of the ways um, uh, the devastating hacks like ECMC Hospital in Buffalo were impacted is hackers remained on that network for about 30 days. Hackers, when they were on the network, were able to laterally move from server A to B to C to D. Multi-factor authentication prevents that from happening because without that token, that hacker can't log into server B. He's, he or she has got to have that token, right? Um, so multi-factor authentication. Good computer hygiene. Computer hygiene is if you have an old account so most companies keep a departed employee's account for about 30 days, 45 days, right? You keep their email, but after that, they should be deleted. There's no reason to have somebody's login ID and password that's seven years old. None whatsoever. Nobody could ever convince me of that. And people have tried. Uh, written information security plan, we've talked enough about that. Uh, IT and employee related policies, we've talked about that. Uh, phishing tests, we just uh, got educated, or some of us got uh, re-educated. And then finally, disaster recovery. Uh, disaster recovery, incidentally, uh, I, I try to keep things simple. A good backup is disaster recovery. You don't have to worry about, you know, recovery time objectives, especially if you're slow, you know, I can only be without this application for an hour, but this application for eight hours. You know how many, uh, when I consult and do disaster recovery plans, I meet with marketing, sales, finance, general counsel, compliance. How many of their applications need to be up and running within an hour? Oh. All of them. Everybody. I mean, so to ask somebody in marketing, well, can you live five hours? Absolutely not. I got to have it within an hour. Now everybody's got a one hour recovery time objective. Not realistic. But if you have a good backup, you're good. And then finally, don't let this happen to you. So DLA Piper is one of the third or fourth largest law firms in the world. Three years ago, they were hit with ransomware uh, out of their UK office. But they had these whiteboards in every single one of their locations worldwide. Uh, if you bother coming in, don't turn your PC on uh, because the network is down. And oh, by the way, we got to get your PC because it might have ransomware on it. It shut them down for a week. I mean, this, this is a firm with 3,000, 4,000 lawyers, not employees, lawyers. So imagine the cost if that happens. Uh, it's that marketing company, and I forgot where this marketing company is. I think they're Midwest, same thing. So um, don't let that happen to you. 
So with that, uh, I want to thank you for your time. I think I'm a little, we started a little early, but I think I'm about five minutes over. So uh, any questions uh, you have for me? I'd encourage you to sign up uh, to our uh, Fox Point Security Hub blog. We are constantly updating it. It gets updated at least a couple times a month. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, and we provide some tips and tricks. And no, we don't provide the top 10 things to reduce a breach. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that to stay up to date. Or quite honestly, any other blog. I want to thank uh, Abani again. I want to thank the Chamber and Maurer for giving me the opportunity to do this. And I want to thank you all for listening to me uh, ramble on and on for the last uh, hour or so. Thank you.